after all we've been through. Everything that I've done. It can't be for nothing. The Last of Us Part 2 came out two years ago today, if you're watching this video as it launches. It was a game that, like the entry that preceded it, marked a huge step forward in the type of stories that video games could be expected to tell. More than that, it was an incredibly fun gameplay experience in terms of the combat encounters, the enemy AI, and the options open to players and how they pressed forward, and it set an important benchmark in showing just how accessible games could be for disabled gamers if they tried. But all of this was overshadowed by the storm of hate, flaming, and controversy around the game up to and beyond its release. From plot leaks to review bombing to death threats, everything that happened then was as ugly and adversarial as Gamergate a few years before. Looking back in 2022, it would be great to speak of all this in the past tense. Unfortunately, while it's not as public as it was and doesn't draw the same attention, the game remains a focal point for the grifters whose income is rooted in outrage bait, those whose insecurity about the world can be manipulated to blame the other, and their need for representation in a world where they too exist and have stories to tell. All that nonsense, from anti-SJW YouTubers to anonymous Twitter accounts whose identity hinges on hating the game, is sadly always going to be part of the context for this game's release and its impact on the world. However, this is thankfully dwarfed by the positives in so many other areas. This video is, I guess, a review of the game, as I wasn't creating content when I first played it upon release, and the anniversary is as good an excuse as any to do that. But it's also a lot more than that. I put timestamps in the description if you want to go to a specific part of the video, but otherwise, settle in for a long one, because there's an awful lot to talk about, and it's going to get deep. There will be spoilers, but I'm going to avoid them until absolutely necessary, and they will come with a warning beforehand. The creation of The Last of Us Part 2 involved the work of 2,169 developers across 14 studios. It was an enormous undertaking. So enormous that it continues to this day, with the multiplayer content that many gamers were expecting after the success of factions in the first game, growing to the point that it will eventually emerge as an entity all of its own. Development on the game began shortly after the release of The Last of Us Remastered for the PlayStation 4 in 2014. This was alongside the development of Uncharted 4 A Thief's End, which released in 2016, and Uncharted The Lost Legacy, which came out in 2017. After both games were out, the full Naughty Dog team was able to pivot towards The Last of Us Part 2. Anthony Newman and Kurt Marginal would serve as co-directors on the game, a first for Naughty Dog, whose games usually had one director. Newman had previously designed Melee Combat for the first game, whilst Marginal had directed Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Amelia Schatz and Richard Cambia, probably co-lead designers on Uncharted 4, took on the same role in this game. Neil Druckmann led the team as creative director and writer, the same roles he had taken on in the first game and in Uncharted 4. However, promoted to Vice President of Naughty Dog in 2018, he actually had less time to write on Part 2 than Part 1. He wrote the majority of the first game, but less than half of the second. Ali Gross came onto the project as narrative lead after finishing her work on Westworld in 2016. At that point, Druckmann had a structure for the story, but Gross was able to add to that with her perspective on characters and trauma. As they worked together to outline the narrative, they mapped out each section of the game and would scrap it if it didn't serve the momentum of the story. In telling the story, which we'll get into the weeds of later on, Naughty Dog recorded performance and motion capture and voice acting simultaneously. The actors wore not only motion capture suits but also head mounted cameras that tracked their facial muscles and eye movements. This meant that when these actors delivered their fantastic performances, every bit of it was reflected in the characters. And when talking about superb acting, we have to credit not just returning stars Troy Baker as Joel and Ashley Johnson as Ellie, but the whole cast. Laura Bailey as Abby, Shannon Woodward as Dina, Ian Alexander as Lev, and Jeffrey Pierce as Tommy were particular standouts, but there was no bad performance in the whole cast. 
As with the first game, the actors themselves had a hand in how their characters developed, both suggesting ideas to Druckmann and improvising during their performances. Druckmann's directorial style, which he had developed in the original The Last of Us, took this in stride and he determined to do 20 or 30 takes as need be to get everything just right. Before we get more into the final product that resulted, it's impossible to discuss the development of this game honestly without talking about crunch. Crunch is a long-standing reality in the video game industry, and in the development of The Last of Us Part 2 this manifested in the form of 12-hour workdays. This schedule continued for months due to the game's delays. It was initially supposed to release on February 21st, 2020. It was first delayed to May 29th to polish the game up, and then indefinitely due to logistical issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, finally releasing on June 19th. Crunch being a reality in the industry doesn't mean that it is inevitable or unavoidable. Bosses across all industries will claim that this or that negative working condition is as natural as the tide, until they are forced, most often by the collective action of workers, to do something about it. The recent shift by some studios to a four-day work week to improve the quality of life of developers, and that there are studios which operate without crunch, shows that change is not only possible, but desirable. And just as there were reports that some developers working on The Last of Us Part 2 hoped it would fail to prove that their working conditions were not viable, so my high opinion of the game doesn't for a second justify the exploitation of workers. We need to see Naughty Dog's next project succeed without crunch. More broadly, we need to see a wholesale culture change in the video games industry. That starts with workers forming unions. Workers organising in their own interest is the key to winning better treatment at work, and as gamers, even if we didn't have empathy for fellow human beings as a matter of course, we should recognise that those creating the media and entertainment we love can do that better, the better they are treated. Ahead of the game's release, the developers knew that it would be controversial. In an interview with Wired, Druckmann said, some of them are not going to like this game, and not like where it goes, and not like what it says or the fate of the characters that they love. He followed that up by saying, I'd rather have people passionately hate it than just be like, yeah, it was okay. In that, he certainly succeeded. The story has always managed to draw out strong, visceral reactions, and there is as much thought-provoking and eye-opening discussion of the game that is highly critical as there is that heaps praise upon the game. However, this is too often drowned out by those who trade on outrage. In late April 2020, Naughty Dog's The Last of Us Part 2 development server was hacked and a large amount of footage was leaked online. The reaction to the details that leaked was a lot of outrage online, including, predictably, the lowest common denominator raging about how woke the game was and opposing the agenda it was pushing. The alphabet people and the feminazis? The game turned into your typical preachy, uh, feminist, lesbian lick fest, you know, with trannies. Before I begin, I would like to happily announce that this game has been approved by the Council of Drag Queen Story Hour. We can't have pretty girls in our media anymore. When the game was released, it was almost immediately the subject of review bombing on Metacritic, and subsequently online abuse aimed at the developers, which included homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, harassment, and death threats. The aforementioned outrage bait YouTubers who have railed against the game from day one didn't send the death threats themselves, of course. They may even have condemned it, albeit in passing, whilst turning it into a whine that all critics of the game will be blamed and making it all about them. Again, out of the tens of thousands of interactions she has every day on Twitter, uh, there are six examples that she has. She says she only wants to share positives, but then she shares this, uh, because she knows that there will be people rallying to her defense. There is going to be an active campaign to lump the, again, microscopic group of people in line with everyone else who hates The Last of Us Part Two because of this story and who has valid criticisms. But nobody is making death threats, harassing, or being bigoted towards the developers because they have a critique of the narrative structure or characterization. They're doing it because they've been whipped up into a frenzy. Whatever insecurities or fears they have about the world, they've been assured are down to wokeness, feminism, or LGBT ideology being shoved down their throats. Nearly every major production company in the entertainment industry at some level has been infiltrated by activists. Activists who care far more about pushing an agenda than they do about actually telling a story. They are the frontline warriors of the culture war, and you cannot claim to bear no responsibility for their actions if your whole grift is getting people like them mad about exactly the things that they decide warrant death threats. You're angry and upset. I am very angry and upset. It's hard to draw a line under this, not just because this game lives rent-free in these people's heads, but also because the aim of all this, from the outrage videos to the death threats, is to shout down anything that contradicts their prejudices, and so it will rear its head again and again. We can't make them go away by simply ignoring them. 
but the more of us willing to call out and refute culture war nonsense, not just in media we love and enjoy, but even in stuff that we may not be too fond of, the more they retreat to the margins, allowing us to properly discuss and critique art and media in a more meaningful way than cheap outrage bait. You know, you really need to stop letting people out you up. Moving beyond the nastiness and controversy to the game itself, it has to be said that the end product is an absolutely stunning piece of work. Even before we get into how it plays or the story, the graphics and the sound design are outstanding. The Last of Us Part 2 uses Naughty Dog's proprietary game engine rather than an openly available engine like Unreal or Unity, and what they've built offers a level of graphical fidelity and photorealism on both people and environments that look truly incredible on the PS4 and PS4 Pro, pushing the systems to their limits. On the PS5, with the more recent enhancements, it remains breathtaking and in no way overshadowed or rendered obsolete by the move to a new generation. There are a number of highly technical reasons for this due to both the engine and the work of the developers that I can't claim to understand. One example is motion matching, which apparently allows the game code to pick, mix and match parts of animations based on context, making animations all the smoother and more realistic. The detail goes over my head, but it's very impressive. Likewise the sound design. Of course there's the 3D sound, commonplace in many games now, which allows you to not only fully immerse yourself with headphones on, but also accurately locate where sounds are coming from, but every environment has a rich interlacing of different noises which builds upon one another, creates a space that feels real. Add to that the gorgeously mournful soundtrack by Gustavo Santolala and Mac Quayle, and the way the game weaves that into the gameplay organically, and you have not just a fully realised environment, but one thick with atmosphere. The way these elements coalesce and just how effective they can be is most apparent in the horror scenes. The Last of Us Part 1 and Part 2 is more of a character driven story than a horror story, even with the Cordyceps outbreak as the backdrop for the choices the characters make. But when they do dive into pure horror, whether Ellie's encounters in the subway, the stalkers in the office block, Abby's nighttime escape through the forest, or what lurks in the hospital, it rarely hits the mark. A survival horror game in this engine, with the claustrophobia and isolation it can evoke, would be truly incredible. Likewise, the environmental and sound design feeds into other emotions as you play through the game. From the tension and risk of stealth in highly populated areas to the adrenaline of chase sequences, you feel it all the more strongly for the way that the game is presented. The attention to detail, the care and precision, and the immersion it offers as a result is truly a thing to behold. The point of all this, though, is to enhance the gameplay experience. All of it would be for nothing, at least in this kind of game rather than something like a visual novel, if the gameplay wasn't any good. Fortunately, it's not just good, it's fantastically fun and a huge step up on its predecessor. On the surface, the gameplay loop is nothing we haven't seen before. In most areas, you can either choose stealth, open combat or some mixture to get through the enemies. Whether you have a choice in who to kill or you must fully clear an area to progress depends on where you are in the narrative. To accomplish your goals, you have a bunch of melee weapons, throwables and guns at your disposal. What elevates this beyond merely competence is a combination of factors. Resource management, the enemy AI, the dexterity and maneuverability of the player character, and the combat balance. Resource management is a key gameplay element. It incentivizes not only collecting items and crafting throughout the campaign, but also strategic decisions about what to craft and what weapons to use in specific encounters. This allows for each player to develop their own strategies and curate their own experience, and increases the challenge in future encounters if you make poor choices. Although the Last of Us series is not survival horror, it utilises this element as effectively as the best of that genre. The enemy AI is crucial, because it makes the encounters feel real. Even with the infected, who when alerted simply attack in a frenzy, it determines just how quiet you have to be to maintain stealth with different infected, and provokes choices in terms of how to approach an area with multiple infected enemy types. With human enemies, it pushes you into making active decisions all the way through the encounter. Beyond normal, alert and on edge states, the humans will actively call out your position if spotted, cover each other if one investigates a noise or sighting, try to flank you, react to you taking hostages, and approach you more cautiously if they see you have a gun and if you're out of ammo or just using melee weapons. There are also encounters where both infected and human enemies, or later rival human factions, populate an environment. This presents its own risks, while also allowing you to use the two groups against one another to progress. As you tackle these situations, your player character's abilities feed into the decisions you make. Melee combat is vastly improved from the first game with the addition of a dodge mechanic. This is important when taking uninfected at close range, or battling melee human enemies. You still have the options from the first game of throwing bricks and bottles to distract or stun, and using melee weapons, including stealing them off humans who wield them, and using them to strike the killing blow. Whilst quite simple, this makes melee combat feel immensely more satisfying than in part 1. 
Beyond that, the different builds of Ellie and Abby as playable characters is reflected in their fighting style and what they're capable of when melee fighting. This adds to the fun of the combat, as well as underscoring that you're playing two very different characters. There's also something of a progression system, as with the first game, wherein you can upgrade your guns by finding parts throughout the game and upgrade your character by finding pills. You won't be able to fully upgrade everything in a single playthrough, so again there are strategic choices to be made, with specific upgrades possibly making combat easier, giving you more resources, or even saving your life in a tight spot. This also adds to replayability, with the option to keep all of your items and upgrades adding variety to New Game Plus, and having a stronger character and weapons may also serve as a leg up to players nervous about trying higher difficulties. Finally, the balance. This is something that Naughty Dog have attuned really well on not just one, but all difficulties, meaning that even on the very light difficulty there is a challenge there, and that the survivor and grounded difficulties feel like a genuine, smooth progression from lower difficulties, rather than the same but with higher HP baddies. You can even tune up different aspects of the challenge, from the availability of resources to the aggression of enemies and allies, to how quickly you're seen in stealth to suit your own needs. This means that the game is managing to both provide a challenge that fits with the intended vision of the game, and at the same time accommodate players of differing skill levels. Which brings us on to the subject of accessibility. Part of making a game accessible is making sure that casual or entry level gamers have a chance to pick up and play it as readily as the hardcore, through customizable challenge levels. But it neither begins or ends at that, and simply slapping an easy mode on a game doesn't mean it's done what it needs to be accessible. The Last of Us Part 2 is perhaps the most accessible video game yet made, with more than 60 different accessibility settings. This includes full controller remapping, one-handed control schemes, options to address motion sickness, colour blindness modifiers, extra speech cues, subtitles you can modify the size and contrast of, directional arrows and closed captions, and more. To develop these options, Naughty Dog work with a range of accessibility consultants. Deaf accessibility specialist Morgan Baker told caniplaythat.com, Naughty Dog emphasised the significance of accessibility, making it one of their top priorities during production and decided to take an own voices approach, where they actively recruited consultants of varying disability backgrounds who are experts in gaming accessibility. I felt both heard and was able to see my suggestions come to life, which is truly something special. This approach is the future of accessibility, and I hope other developers are paying attention and will consider taking a similar approach. I'm not disabled, and I have no need for these options, so I can't speak to them myself. However, the feedback from the disabled gaming community and from accessibility advocates has been overwhelmingly positive, and it's important in discussing these questions that we give ground to those most directly affected by them. However, as far as The Last of Us Part 2 has come in terms of accessibility, it still has its shortcomings. Grant Stoner, mobility editor of caniplaythat.com, wrote in his mobility review, Unfortunately, the most accessible game to date did not account for my inability to grasp a controller. There was no tearful moments of examining every accessibility option nor did I make it a personal mission to acquire my first platinum trophy. It was nothing but pure frustration. For approximately one hour I tried, and subsequently failed, to twist and turn my hands just to be able to utilise my controller. The furthest I progressed was simply the dashboard of my PlayStation 4, and I only achieved that because my mother turned on the console. He does go on to say that his feelings of anger and hopelessness were not directed to Naughty Dog. A single title featuring roughly 60 accessibility options is nothing short of revolutionary for the gaming industry. Each developer and designer should be extensively praised for including disabled voices within the overall design process. But still, he goes on, if nothing else, my experience is proof that every disability is unique. What may work for most players will surely cause problems for others. Yet, instead of tearing down the accomplishments that ultimately better the industry, I encourage disabled gamers to applaud these initiatives. It admittedly hurts to not be able to gush with excitement alongside my friends and colleagues, but it also fills me with a sense of pride to know that disabled individuals are actively making a difference. All of which, finally, brings us on to the story. The Last of Us Part 2's story is a direct continuation of the story in Part 1. The events in their entirety are concerned with the consequences of Joel's choices in the final act. This makes it a true sequel rather than simply a separate adventure starring the same characters. Talking in generalities here is difficult. Before we go into spoilers and a full breakdown of the narrative, I'm going to try to do just that. There will be a warning before any spoilers come. The plot of The Last of Us Part 1 was well worn and in itself nothing new. We'd seen journeys across post-apocalyptic America by a father and child pair and or in search of a cure before. 
What set it apart was in the characterization and how the plot and setting were ultimately a vehicle for the growth of the relationship between Joel and Ellie. Joel's true journey isn't from Boston to Salt Lake City, but from a broken, hard-hearted shell of himself who did brutal things to survive as someone more capable of love and care for another. In much the same way, we've seen stories of loss, revenge and redemption beyond number before now. The Last of Us Part 2 story isn't so much this plot, but the relationships between the characters and the arcs they go through. The backdrop is grand and breathtaking, both the physical scenery and the political and cultural climate of the various factions. We can see their ideologies and prejudices both through their own rose-tinted glasses and from the view of those who cross them, without ever needing it spelled out in a way that would break immersion. Yet as fully realised as all of this is, it's still just the setting for a more personal interplay of grief, trauma, hope and redemption. The combined performance, motion and voice capture by the actors means that their fantastic performances are fully realised in what we see on screen. Whilst the voices alone are, as before, expertly done, some of the most effective moments of storytelling happen without dialogue. Their faces betray thoughts and realisations they never have to spell out through exposition. Shots of trembling hands in silence speak volumes, and even body language builds up a picture of character that makes them feel so much more real. It's also worth noting that the story isn't just the sum of the cutscenes. The gameplay is hugely important to world building, not only in the obvious point of interactions between the player and NPCs as they move from A to B, or overheard conversations between other NPCs, including allies and enemies alike, but even in the combat encounters. The enemy AI working together to take you on not only fleshes out the combat encounters, but also paints a picture of your antagonists in a way that feeds into the narrative. A big part of this game is about perspectives, with the same characters coming off very different when viewed through the lens of opposing player characters, and the combat feeds into that as well. Overall, this game once more delivers something that feels real. Characters going through their journeys are messy, complicated, sometimes contradictory in all the ways that real people are. The narrative, the world building and the acting all come together to make you empathise with the player character and yet still be able to cry out in frustration when they act irrationally or self-destructively, much as you might with a friend exhibiting the same behaviour. I'm gonna find... and I'm gonna kill... every last one of them. All spoilers for the entire game follow for this next section. If you don't want that, then please use the timestamps in the description to jump ahead. You have been warned. Jesus Christ, Joel. What do you do? At the outset of the game, Joel recounts to his brother Tommy the decision he took at the end of the first game. That, finding out the Firefly's efforts to develop a cure would kill Ellie, he fought his way through them to save her. Tommy promises to take the secret to his grave if he has to. Whilst recounting this, Joel is cleaning a guitar which he then presents to Ellie, promising to teach her how to play. The guitar will be a recurring motif of Ellie's sections of the game, not only symbolising her connection to Joel, but also serving as the link from the present into the past when we get flashbacks. Before we get to that, however, we can see an awful lot in this scene about Joel and Ellie's relationship without it being spelled out in exposition. From facial expressions to body language to the delivery of the dialogue, we see not only the affection between the two, most obvious in Ellie's reactions to Joel's rendition of Future Days and his clock joke, but also the tension that is beginning to establish itself and the distance it will eventually create. At the end of the first game, Ellie asked Joel to tell the truth about the cure and he lied. And whether it was her disbelief or her disappointment, it was obvious in that moment that there was an impact. We can still feel its presence in this scene. This prologue effectively serves as the epilogue that the first game might have had in the more traditional narrative. Joel's actions to this point appear to have paid off positively, and under the golden glow of the sun over Jackson, the utopia amongst the post-apocalyptic carnage of America, he has regained a sense of self and a connection to family. But, of course, this wasn't the epilogue to the first game. That part ended with the ambiguity of Ellie's reaction to Joel's lie, and in the prologue here we can see the cracks in the happy ending that Joel has made for himself. As bright and golden as the sunset is, it always sees the shadows grow in the distance. The immediate sense of trepidation that this will fall apart is expertly established with an incredible level of subtlety. We are then brought forward to the game's present, four years later. A knock on the door jolts Ellie awake. It's very early in the morning, but much of the town is already awake and she is late for her turn on patrol. We are introduced to Jesse, a friend of Ellie's, funny and pretty easygoing, but also a leader in the community well aware of his responsibilities. As they travel across Jackson, we're given an awful lot of information at once, not just in the dialogue, but also the visual storytelling of the community around them. What we see is a thriving, self-sufficient community, one that survived not simply by scavenging for resources of a world that is 25 years dead, but by producing something on its own terms and trading with others. 
This is something we will see later on in the game as well in the two antagonistic communities of Seattle, and it is important in the wider world building sense. But more crucially, it opens the story in a hopeful status quo. The first game started with the outbreak and brought us into the oppressive Boston quarantine zone, establishing a hard world that required hard people. In the second game, the colour and life of Jackson shows us that something new can bloom in the ruins of what was, and people could not merely survive, but thrive. The contrast couldn't be clearer not only in this setting, but its implications. Now Ellie, unlike Joel in part 1, has something to lose. A lot to lose. The story is already establishing the stakes, even before we reach the inciting incident. We are reintroduced to Maria, who forces Seth to reconcile with Ellie over his homophobic comments to her the night before, and then urges her to speak to Joel. These relatively short interactions not only establish Maria as the matriarch of the town, constantly working to not only keep the place safe and functioning, but also resolve conflicts, it reinforces the idea of a rift between Joel and Ellie, and a distance that will fuel the decisions she makes further into the game. We then meet Dina. We get your girlfriend at the stables, please. And immediately the performances convey without the need for additional exposition both their attraction to one another and the awkwardness resulting from the night before and its subsequent fallout. The snowball fight that follows is both a fun moment, more visual storytelling in terms of the closeness of the community and its distance from the apocalypse beyond its walls, and a nice minigame that gives the player something to do in the midst of a very cutscene heavy opening. From here, Ellie and Dina gear up to go on patrol, with Jesse set to relieve Joe and Tommy as they have been up for a long time. We're then put in the shoes of Abby for the first time. When we meet Abby, we don't even know her name, let alone her purpose, yet the music immediately offers a sense of foreboding. Once Owen says he has to show her something, this only amps up the suggestion that something is wrong. The banter between the two on the way does a lot in a short space of establishing their dynamic as friends and former lovers who know each other almost as well as they know themselves. There is trust there, but something heavier weighs on their shoulders. When they stand on the precipice overlooking Jackson, we learn that they are hunting for someone, with unpleasant purposes in mind. Though it isn't yet stated who, this immediately tells us that Abby is on course towards conflict with the characters we already know in Jackson. Owen is having second thoughts, however, which pushes Abby to go off on her own. His dialogue here foreshadows his later struggles with his own conscience. I fucking knew I couldn't count on you. Abby, I want what you want, but not at any cost. Her combat encounters here serve as a tutorial for the gameplay. But from a storytelling perspective, her push forward through increasingly risky groups of infected tells us of her single-minded determination as much as the fact that she went off on her own in the first place and in her melee combat with the runners, it is immediately apparent the power in her hands. Whoever she is after is in real danger. <laughs> Ellie and Dina's efforts to clear out the infected in the supermarkets also serve as game tutorial, albeit more in depth as it is Ellie's combat style we will need to be familiar with for the next 10 hours or so. Before that set piece, we see the romantic tension growing taut between them, and just how close they are even as friends. Fuck. If we look in Ellie's journal early on, we can even see an entry in there where she urges herself not to mess up the friendship and where she describes feeling scared, elated and anxious after their kiss. After the infected are dealt with and they seek shelter from the oncoming blizzard in the library, that tension pops after the discovery of a deceased Jacksonite Eugene's weed stash. Away from the threat of infected or the prying eyes of the town, they finally stop dancing around their feelings. As short an arc as this is, it works because the story is not fundamentally about romance, so it sets up the dynamic between the two, which will be important later on as Ellie's actions take their toll on her and those around her, without drawing it out unnecessarily and while still creating emotional investment for the player. Back as Abby, we are almost immediately thrust into a race for our lives. As well as superbly capturing the frenzy and panic that a horde of infected creates, this also firmly establishes the danger Joel and Tommy are in, as they are in the midst of facing off against this when Joel saves Abby. This moment, the combat in the enclosed space where the gondolas are kept, and fleeing to a temporary safe haven leaves Abby in a panicked fight or flight response, superbly portrayed by Laura Bailey. Yet there is enough about her to realise when Tommy, trying to calm her, tells her who they are, he's found who she is looking for. None of this is said aloud, but the calculation is evident in her eyes, and before they even reach her friend's hideout and presumed safety from the horde, Joel's fate is sealed. <laughs> Tommy and Joel allow themselves a moment to breathe when they get indoors. They're lucky to have escaped with their lives and the group they have found shelter among are the reason they did. Even so, before their names leave their mouths, Abby already has a shotgun in hand. The second she was off the horse, she moved decisively, knowing what she had to do. The others move quickly to get in step with her, but the speed at which this has all happened is most evident on Mel's face, betraying her shock, fear and even sadness in that moment at what she has become part of. Meanwhile, Jesse finds Ellie and Dina in his search for Joel and Tommy, who haven't shown up to their rendezvous point. 
The three split up in search of them, and it's Ellie who finds the hideout of Abby's group burned and infected at the gates, and lights on inside. The scene that follows is utterly harrowing and heart-wrenching. We see the ruin that Abby has reduced Joel to, blood running across his face, immobile and barely still breathing. Though we see blood and the impact of the moment of his death, the angle we get is not gratuitous. Instead, it tears at our heartstrings as Ellie and Joel's eye contact, him helpless to do anything, warrior air presence playing on his face, broken by that moment of brutality, and he is unceremoniously ripped from her life. We are only an hour into the game at this point. Yet, even for a game heavy with narrative as this one is, this prologue is the most densely packed with story beats. It's not only recapped the first game, but established the slightly broken dynamic between Joel and Ellie, which is now unresolved thanks to his death, set up the other relationships which Ellie will lean on in the aftermath, and which will be tested by her actions, and fleshed out Abby as an antagonist without giving us any firm details on her origins or motives. This latter point allows her to feel real as a character while still letting the player lean into exactly the sadness, rage and hatred that Ellie feels towards her. This game is the continuation of the story from the first game, and the protagonist has been cruelly torn from us as much as from Ellie. He's our antagonist too, a deliberate choice which, of course, fueled a lot of the hate the game got, but which also serves to make the impact of this moment so effective, and how well done later narrative decisions are all the more incredible. In the scenes that immediately follow Joel's death, there is a weight that feels as heavy, almost suffocating, as any real world loss. Through the dialogue we learn that Jackson cannot retaliate as a community without leaving itself vulnerable, and as such Tommy takes on the mission alone in the hopes of preventing Ellie from going, only for Maria to let her and Dina go, charged with bringing Tommy home in one piece. But all of this is cushioned in a moment of grief. We will soon be in Seattle and driving forward into action, but before then we get the chance to mourn Joel at his grave and see Ellie's pain and the community's love. As we leave Jackson, we won't be examining every single beat of the story in as much detail as we have so far. Otherwise, this would be a much, much longer video. I've gone into this because I feel the amount it established and foreshadowed warranted it. Once we reach Seattle, things still seem relatively slow at first, only to quickly spiral out of control. The WLF are nowhere to be seen at the borders of the QZ, allowing Ellie and Dina to explore in search of gas and supplies. In this part of the game, as we wander freely and Ellie and Dina make small talk and jokes, the reality of what brought them to Seattle seems distant, theoretical. Yo, check this out. Wow, that was... that was an interesting beat. Excuse me, I am a natural. Admit it. I love you. We have yet to meet any human enemies, and there is even time for a romantic serenade. This works in the moment to show the affection between the two, but also to show that the full weight of what they have taken on has yet to hit them. Ellie knows the loss of Joel and the need for revenge, but not yet what that truly means. When we reach the first known enemy base, Seravina, still there are no living enemies. But this is because Tommy has wiped everyone out, including Nick, one of the crew who helped kill Joel. In the trail of blood he has left behind, we as players, and Ellie, now start to see what vengeance really means. Not in a theoretical notion of justice or setting things right, but in terms of what is necessary to achieve it. The darkness of this moment heavily foreshadows Ellie's journey, the descent. Meanwhile, it seems that the WLF aren't that big a threat. We've met only their corpses so far, and you'd be forgiven for letting your guard down. Ellie and Dina are in mid-conversation about where to hole up and plan their next move when... <laughs> their horse dead, Dina barely escapes and Ellie is captured. She finds her own knife at her throat thanks to Jordan, another of Joel's killers who she scarred during the incident. He wants Ellie alive to interrogate, wanting to know how many are here seeking retribution for Joel, but the WLF leader Isaac wants all trespassers dead. Dina saves Ellie and Ellie returns the favour, ending Jordan's life two killers down and they have photos and names for the rest but they cannot think about that yet a battle through the school leads them out into the streets of capitol hill where the wlf are out in force hunting the trespassers but also guarding against the rival faction scars once past this area we see the first sign of them in religious graffiti of their prophets and then at the tv station where jordan's girlfriend leah is stationed we find their handiwork leah is already dead and her comrades have been strung up and disemboweled this is definitely not tommy we will have reinforcements chase ellie and dina into the sewers where they encounter a new type of infected called shamblers and end up running for their lives ellie's mask breaks and dina discovers ellie's immunity 
Dina is overtaken by sickness and has to be carried the last leg towards safety by Ellie, who then learns she is pregnant. As the two confront these new truths about one another, this is the first moment where we are given to breathe in what has been a full day of conflict and pursuit. But their emotions overwhelm them, creating conflict. Dina finds Ellie's immunity hard to believe, even having witnessed it, whilst Ellie lashes out at Dina for her pregnancy, the first threat to her revenge mission that hasn't come from the enemy. Well, you're a burden now, aren't you? In this moment, we see Ellie's instant regret at her choice of words, but she still expresses frustration at it out of Dina's earshot, and it is a sign of things to come. Vengeance is her top priority, and as she goes deeper into that obsession, then the people she cares about become inconveniences or obstacles where they don't aid that goal. Getting the power back on leads to her finding a guitar, and the opening lyrics of future days connect Ellie to the past, and to Joel. This flashback is a nice breather from the intensity of day one, both narratively and in terms of gameplay. We see Ellie in happier times, being led towards a birthday surprise by Joel, which turns out to be a museum trip and a cassette tape of an Apollo launch. This gives us one of the most heartwarming moments of the game. But again, we are reminded of the tension that underpins their relationship when she travels alone through a dark, empty area daubed with the graffiti of a man disillusioned with the Fireflies and the crimes he committed for them. Returning to the Fireflies in itself recalls the end of the first game, of course, but the notes about their disbanding and that they could not achieve their stated goals push against Ellie's own internal conflict. Does her life mean anything, if not as the key to the cure? Joel finds her just as she shines a light on the word liars under the Firefly logo, and with a few words the warmth of the earlier moment floats away. His lies hang between them, weighed down by what his actions left in their wake. On day two, Dina's sickness has worsened. However, he has gotten the radio working and plotted out the WLF movements based on their communications. Ellie and Dina reconcile here, but that reconciliation is based upon Dina proving her use. The mission still comes first, but for now, that drive is still being enabled. The journey through the Hillcrest neighbourhood, the area densely packed with WLF who are on the warpath against another trespasser, believed to be Tommy, produces not only some of the hardest combat encounters in the game, but also yet another narrow escape from death. Two full-scale manhunts intersect as Ellie discovers that the other trespasser is actually Jesse, having followed, hoping to look out for his friends. They don't have long to catch up before being caught up in a car chase gun battle, and then a horde of infected descending upon the resulting carnage. At the end, Jesse is, unsurprisingly, worse for wear and in need of rest. As Dina moves in to look after him, the physical distance that this moment places between her and Ellie highlights the emotional distance that still lingers between them, but it also reflects the emotional distance between Ellie and Joel as we are drawn into another flashback. This is something Tommy brings up with her as they return to Joel, urging her to talk to him, which in turn leads to a ride in search of guitar strings. Joel tries to connect with Ellie through the comic books she reads, as well as by expressing how impressed he is with her conduct on patrols, while still cautioning her to be careful. However, a shortcut through a hotel and a very close call with a bloater leads them to the bodies of teenagers who went missing from Jackson the year before. Their death to infection once more brings up the question of Ellie's immunity and what it meant, and Joel swears that what he told her at the end of the first game was true. There was no cure. Now, however, her expression contains far less ambiguity as to whether she trusts his answer. Despite neither Dina nor Jesse being in any condition to go with her, and the night closing in, the revelation of Nora's location spares Ellie to go back out. Again, her single-mindedness prevails, and now it leads her into both literal and figurative darkness. Before reaching the hospital and Nora, Ellie has to contend with stalkers in the dark confines of an office block with too many narrow doorways and low barriers to hide behind as they try to ambush her. Then she must move through a forest filled with religious cultists communicating in whistles, the night illuminated only by the fire on their torches, and the trees decorated with the corpses of their victims. These scenes both offer incredibly tense gameplay and effective horror, first monstrous then human in form. That this tension and horror is the direct result of her decision to pursue Nora doesn't feel accidental. Especially when, after pursuing Nora through the hospital and into the spores ridden lower floors, the camera angle shifts and Ellie becomes the subject of the horror as she makes Nora talk. Afterwards, she is left trembling and shocked, and we know without it needing to be said that this comes not from what was inflicted upon her, whether by stalkers and scars or by the demons of her own mind, but from what she let out of herself. The 
Immediately after this, we revisit Joel's actions in the first game in a flashback where Ellie returns to St. Mary's Hospital and finds the proof that Joel lied to her. He still cannot confess it the right way, and we can see the pain that tears him up inside as he wrestles with doing so, but it is necessary to avoid losing her forever, so he tells the truth. This is where the tension and distance in their relationship tears open. The revelation breaks Ellie, who views it as Joel having taken away the one thing she could do with real meaning. After all we've been through. Everything that I've done. I can't be for nothing. Again, without exposition, this immediately tells us a lot about why Ellie has allowed herself to pursue this vendetta so single-mindedly. Not just the loss of Joel, but guilt at what became of their relationship before that loss. It cannot be for nothing. On day three, Ellie's obsession comes to a head. She now knows Abby is in the aquarium, but Jessie is coming with her, and their stated aim is to find Tommy and head home so that they can take care of Dina and all be safe. Jessie asks her if she's okay with that, and she says that she is. When we find Tommy, you're good with going home. Yeah. You'll be leaving some of those assholes alive. Dina should be back in Jackson. Okay. Good. But even when he asks if she's worried that the WLF will retaliate, he seems blind to the possibility. They're only in Seattle because of Abby's actions, and that Abby only came to Jackson due to Joel's actions doesn't resonate. She cannot reckon with the cycle of violence, only that she is in the right and therefore must carry on what she is doing. This comes to a head when the pair learn of a sniper at the marina, which must be Tommy. Yes, he sets off in pursuit, but Ellie breaks her promise and still determines to go on to the aquarium without him. After fighting her way there, he finds Abby gone, but confronts her friends Owen and Mel. As she tries to get them to reveal Abby's location, a fight breaks out and she kills them both. That's when she learns Mel is heavily pregnant and throws up in shock and revulsion before Tommy and Jesse find her. This seems to be enough to set Ellie back to her senses, at least temporarily, and she's willing to head back to Jackson with the group, even though it means Abby gets to live. They got what they deserved. But she gets to live. <sighs> yeah. Is that okay? It has to be. But then Abby shows up, killing Jesse and taking Tommy hostage. We let you both live. And you wasted it! It's at this point that the game's point of view switches to Abby, of course one of the most controversial decisions the developers made. Although telling a story from opposing viewpoints is nothing new in films or books, it's largely unheard of in games. Even if you can choose to play as opposing sides in a conflict, a stark perspective switch halfway through isn't something you see, especially after, as we've already looked at, so much has been done to draw genuine hate towards the person you're now expected to play as. That, of course, is the point. When we saw Abby kill Joel, we had no idea as to why. All we saw was the single-minded brutality of it, the fury levelled against him, and the heavy grief of the aftermath. With all of that loaded against the character, is it possible to then render them sympathetic? Technically, yes. We've seen this done before in storytelling outside of games. The most direct analogue to Abby is probably Negan in The Walking Dead, who commits a similarly heinous crime against a beloved character before getting his own backstory explored and redemption arc. My knowledge of this is based off reading the comics, I have no idea where the TV show takes the character. However, it's a more uphill struggle than a game where we have direct agency through the player character. How it makes players feel will differ, and opinion is divided, but this is at least my experience of it. We go back four years to find Abby searching for her father, Jerry, who has gone off unannounced. It turns out that he is tracking a pregnant zebra, who we then help free from barbed wire, before the reveal that they are fireflies based at St. Mary's Hospital, and Jerry is their head surgeon. As we play through this part, we learn that Jerry has sussed out Abby and Owen's relationship and that she is close to her father, their relationship defined by banter and a shared love of coin collecting. But we also know what's about to happen, and next we see the discussion between Marlene and Jerry over whether they should do the surgery on Ellie, knowing the girl will die. Jerry advocates for it, saying it will make all their sacrifices to that point worthwhile. Marlene, heavy-hearted, agrees and goes to tell Joel. In this interaction, and Abby's subsequent assertion that she would want her father to do the surgery if it was her, we see a very different side to the interaction that ended the first game. There, Joel was forced at gunpoint out of the hospital, knowing the girl he had grown to love would die, and he wouldn't even get to say goodbye. Just as from his point of view the morality of acting to save her was clear cut, so too is the morality clear from the Firefly's point of view. Which we agree with is up to us, but this is a very clear signal that in playing as Abby, we will see the world through her eyes. 
this shift not just in player but in perspective is what caused a lot of anger from some but this is not naughty dog rebuking and disowning joel's actions they cast no judgment it's up to us as the player to see the world through ellie's eyes see the world through abby's eyes and make our own mind up there might not even be a clear cut definitive right and wrong they're all this is a world built in shades of gray but even if the morality isn't clear the consequences are Abby collapses in Owen's arms, weeping for her father, then stands triumphant over his killer as Ellie weeps for him in the background. After Joel's death, most of the crew argue to kill Ellie and Tommy, but Owen pushes against it. This calls back to his line earlier where he wants what she wants, but not at any cost. Abby settles the matter by saying that they're done. In doing so, she reflects the same absolute moral certainty that Ellie displayed when not worrying that the WLF might retaliate. She did what she did to right a wrong, so what has anyone got to come back against? This tells us that the arc Ellie is currently going through, gliding into obsession in pursuit of revenge, is one that Abby has already travelled through. Abby. <gasps> and in the present, it has brought her no peace as she is still having nightmares. Waking from them, she moves out of the WLF stadium home, called up to the forward operating base. Here, again, we see a rebirth of society. The WLF don't scavenge, they produce. Farming, growing vegetables, making clothes and other goods, even having fully functioning schools and gyms. But where a self-sufficient Jackson served as a hopeful status quo to be snatched away by the violence that pulls Ellie towards revenge, here the stadium serves as a last refuge from conflict-ravaged Seattle, where people are united first by hatred towards the other and the existential threat it poses to their home. We can see the ideological blinkers this form of unity creates when Abby and Manny justify the shooting of Seraphite children by WLF soldiers on the basis of us versus them, even though all they did was throw stones. This makes explicit the fact that the WLF Seraphite conflict is based on Israel and Palestine. It is interesting in that context then, that in the narrative we are clearly shown that every step to exacerbate the conflict was taken by the WLF, yet this is still presented as a cycle of violence, rather than clear aggression by one side, apparently justified by the religious fanaticism of the other. Outside of the stadium, a Seraphite ambush forces Abby, Manny and Mel to retreat through an infected ridden garden centre, fight their way across a train yard and survive an ambush at a petrol station until reinforcements show up. In that time, we learn that the events of Jackson have not only failed to give Abby peace, but they have haunted both Mel and Owen and put a distance between them. In this way, Joel is still driving Abby's narrative arc, as this will be the catalyst for all that follows. At the fob, Mel needs medical treatment. Abby and Manny see Nora, who shows them the body of Danny, a soldier who was on rotation with Owen. In both the room full of body bags and later Isaac's comments to Manny, we get hints that the war with the Seraphites is a war the WLF are losing. No losses on our side, just some minor injuries. Can't say the same for them. Wish I was hearing more of that. Perhaps this is why Isaac intends to attack the Seraphite island with the full force of the WLF. He can see no other way out of the war than total annihilation, a fatalistic pragmatism telling him that another truce is doomed to failure. He wants Abby and Manny to lead the first wave, but Abby's focus is Owen, and bringing him up she quickly learns that Danny told Isaac he was shot by Owen, apparently to protect the Seraphite. Manny and Abby don't believe this, but they also recognise that it's a story that could get Owen killed by their own side, so Abby resolves to go in search of Owen, believing she already knows where he'll be. This takes us back to when, having first joined up with the WLF, Abby and Owen explore an old aquarium that Owen will turn into a refuge for himself. This section again serves as a breather, a retreat to happier times, but as with Ellie's flashbacks, there's an undertone of what's to come. This is reflected in Owen's musing about whether the Seraphites are crazy, after learning that the children who decorated the aquarium so imaginatively ended up joining them, demonstrating that he is already starting to question the received dogma, even as she determines to hold on to it, perhaps the only thing she can hold on to with what has already been snatched away, the only hope she ever has of righting the wrong of her father's death. Let's go back. We can still make training. Go ahead. Back in the present, her journey towards the aquarium takes her through Seraphite territory. Despite persevering through several heavily guarded areas, this ultimately ends with her being captured and knocked out, and once more flashing back to the aquarium. Owen has done the place up for Christmas, further cementing the location as his refuge from the realities of war as a member of the WLF. When Abby arrives, he insists on no work talk, clearly wanting to separate this place from their shared cause. But after playing around with a bow and arrow, ultimately she reveals the reason for her visit. They have a lead on Joel, and Isaac has agreed to let them pursue it. But this isn't good news for Owen, and his hesitation is evident. 
Perhaps he thought it would never come to this. But either way, the scene ends on a sad, wistful note where Owen's thoughts are unclear. We're doing this together, right? Abby awakens in the darkness of the forest, illuminated only by the Seraphites burning torches. Other walls have already been strung up and disemboweled, and she is next. The intensity and horror of this scene bleeds through the screen. But another prisoner, a runaway Seraphite called Yara, is captured and has an arm broken with a hammer. The terror of the moment is visceral. Even rescue comes with no reprieve. When Yara's brother Lev comes to the rescue, Abby manages to kill the Seraphite leader, but even in that moment the WLF Seraphite antagonism is so strong that there's hesitation before Yara orders Lev to cut Abby down. That one act breaks down a barrier between them, but there's no time to reflect on it yet. First, stalkers come out of the woods to attack them and must be fought off. Then the brute Seraphite who captured Abby attacks Yara and Lev, so Abby must fight and kill her, retrieving her equipment. Finally, Abby must fend off waves of the infected in an old restaurant until Lev and Yara find a way out. In that fight, Abby panics and laments trusting the enemy, only to be proven wrong when they come to her rescue. Finally, Abby splints Yara's arm and leaves the two in an old porter cabin, warning them that for their safety they need to be gone by daybreak. Lev is still uneasy about who Abby is, but it is clear that Abby is starting to worry. Still, she cannot dwell as she must push on and reach Owen. When she does, she learns that Owen's questioning of their cause has finally come to a head. After Joel, after seeing Jackson and returning to Seattle, after continuing to get mired in bloody conflict, he has had enough. I'm tired, Abby. I don't want to fight over land that I don't give a fuck about anymore. He wants to go to Santa Barbara to chase the rumour that the Fireflies are regrouping. Abby argues that this is nonsense and they can make things right with Isaac. She still wants to be part of the greater cause and fight, but Owen will not budge. Their fighting soon turns into sex, partly because they still have feelings for one another, but most likely due to all of their emotions about everything spilling over and this offering a release for it all. Either way, that night Abby's nightmares focus on the fate of Lev and Yara, and against everything she believes in, she knows that she must save them. <laughs> After going back to rescue Lev and Yara, Abby finds that Mel has come to the aquarium. This is fortunate for Yara as she can treat the compartment syndrome in her arm, as long as Abby can get the right supplies, but it also puts a wedge between Abby and Owen. Abby doesn't believe that what happened between them meant anything, but Owen does, and says that they are allowed to be happy. Even if he is going about it the wrong way, that sentiment is clearly something that resonates through the rest of Abby's arc. With Lev, Abby takes a shortcut to the hospital using the high roads built by the Seraphites. This leads to confrontation with enemies who dead name Lev as Lily, revealing the reason he fled from the cult. This is dealt with superbly in the narrative, showing us rather than telling, and not relying on needless exposition. Did you hear what they called me? Yeah. Do you want to ask me about it? Do you want me to ask you about it? No. Okay. This feels far more genuine to the moment than the entire story stopping for a monologue from Lev about his transness, or Abby promising to be a good ally. That one moment sums everything up perfectly, gives us a snapshot of Lev's journey, and brings the two characters closer in trust without halting the forward momentum. After moving through more Seraphites and a whole building full of infected, they reach the hospital and Abby goes in alone as the WLF would attack Lev. She is arrested because she has gone AWOL, and Nora frees her so she can still search for medical supplies. Yet despite the trust between the two allowing for this action, which we saw in Ellie's side of the game puts Nora under scrutiny from the WLF, Abby cannot tell her the truth about who the supplies are for. The trust of the group goes above the ideology of the WLF, and yet the hold of that ideology is so strong that the idea of sympathy for the enemy, even a defector, is unthinkable. Abby is still at this point caught halfway between her old loyalties and her new friendships. In the hospital basement, Abby finds the medical supplies she needs for Mel to perform the surgery, though not before seeing the horrors of Ground Zero and the monstrosity that formed there. <laughs> After horror comes reflection, as everyone waits for the surgery to be done and Abby wonders aloud what happened to them. Owen's comment that maybe they stopped looking for the light highlights both the dark path that Abby has trodden and his own doubts about the WLF and the war they are fighting. 
in the night, Abby wants more dreams of the Firefly Hospital and the long path to the surgery where her father was murdered. But no alarms sound now. There is no gun in her hand. She opens the door and he smiles at her. Finally, not through killing Joel, but through rescuing Lev and Yara, he has found closure. Redemption, perhaps, or at the very least, peace. The next day, Yara is in a far better state from the surgery. However, after relaying this news, Mel turns on Abby. She's going with Owen to Santa Barbara, but only on the condition Abby doesn't join them. She finds it too hard to believe that Abby has changed, and this is perhaps clouded by the threat she perceives to her relationship with Owen. Before she has time to dwell on that, Yara asks for Abby's help in finding Lev. The siblings have had a fight and Lev ran off. He's worried for his mother, who he fears will be punished for the sins of the children. Yara had tried to convince him that she was too devout to be saved, but he wouldn't listen. In the searching, we get a sweet moment with Abby and Yara playing fetch with Alice, though her initial fear is a reminder of the war that has hung over them both for so long. They then talk about why Lev shaved his head, and again so much is said beyond the words used, painting a clear picture of the oppression that Lev and Yara lived under. We also get a moment between Yara and Abby here in which Yara vindicates Abby's actions and tells her she's a good person. Meanwhile, Owen still can't get past his feelings for Abby, even though she doesn't feel the same way. When they learn that Lev has gone to the Seraphite Island after his mother and Abby and Yara go after him, Owen wants to come too, much to Mel's shock and anger. However, despite what Mel said to her earlier, Abby chastises Owen to get his priorities straight. We see from Ellie's gameplay that this only leads to Owen and Mel arguing, Owen wanting to pursue her, and Mel believing she's already dead, before the two of them meet their fate in the following confrontation. This leaves Owen's arc incomplete, but short by Ellie's intervention. He's moved away from a cause he no longer believed in, but never got the chance to pursue what he did believe in, or resolve his muddled up feelings for Abby and Mel. Looking for a boat on the marina, Abby reunites with Manny, who tells her that the last three days have seen the WLF plague by trespassers. One of them is a sniper who now has Abby and Manny pinned down. They push towards him undercover and chase him into an airport, only for Manny to be abruptly killed by a headshot, his blood splattering Abby's face. In her horror, she dives into refuge, then pushes forward once more, only to come face to face with Tommy. After pushing him into the sea, everything hits her all at once. The consequences of what she did to Joel are coming back on her. Manny is dead. Is he the only one or are others dead too? He doesn't know and we can feel her panic. But, unlike in Jackson when she went off alone, she is in that moment able to focus on the task at hand. Lev is in trouble. The Seraphite Island is too dangerous for him anyway and is about to be invaded by the WLF. Making their way across the island, Abby and Yara find Lev in his old house, his mother dead nearby. He attacked him on sight and he pushed her, leading to her hitting her head. Again, there's no need for grand exposition about the pain of families rejecting children for their identities. Lev's stuttered apology, his trembling and the heartbreak in his eyes says it all. Moving on, they soon find themselves in the midst of a battle. Unfortunately, this leads to Yara being shot at the hands of a WLF soldier. Abby springs into action. The soldier recognises Abby, but that only leads to half a moment's hesitation. When Isaac and more WLF appear, he orders Abby to step away from Lev, saying they can sort things out but being clear that as part of that, Lev will die. This is the moment that cements Abby's shift in loyalty. She recognises now the futility and pointless horror of the conflict, and that standing up for those we love is far more important. She will not move. Yara is not quite dead, and her final act is to shoot Isaac, allowing Abby and Lev to escape. In the next encounter, and beyond, we hear the venom the WLF direct towards Abby over her betrayal. There is no room for questioning or explanation, only retribution. We now see the WLF in combat in much the same way as we did when playing as Ellie. The gameplay is much as the cutscenes underlining the movements Abby has gone through in her character arc, and we can once again recognise the fury and fanaticism of the WLF side, because Abby too is recognising it. Pushing on to Haven, on foot then by horse, the conflict escalates around the characters until we are finally surrounded by flames and gunfire. Our last encounter, with a seraphite brute who attacked Lev, sees that man continue to fight in a frenzy even when mutilated and near death. Furious, relentless obsession, with the flames rising all around, is emblematic of the entire conflict and what it has wrought. The fighting continues even as Abby and Lev sail away, but they have not escaped because the consequences of Abby's earlier actions still await them in the form of Owen and Mel's corpses.
We find ourselves back where Ellie's gameplay ended, with Abby pointing a gun at her. Except now we know that Lev is with her, and when he asks what they'll do when they find Tommy, Abby answers. Just figure out how to get in first. We know payback is on her mind, but she doesn't want to get into that with Lev. He's seen too much violence already and she cares for him, so doesn't want to put more on him. Again, this is communicated without exposition. In the moment, Tommy tries to give Ellie space to escape and takes a bullet to the head. Ellie then flees, with Abby in pursuit. The fight ends with Abby brutally beating Ellie on the floor, at which point Dina rushes to intervene. Abby overpowers her too. The whole scene is unrestrained brutality, with everything on the line for both sides. However, when Abby goes to kill Dina, Ellie pleads for her life. She's pregnant. Good. Abby. Lev's intervention saves Dina here, and Abby of course lets her and Ellie go. But this is also a sign of how far she has come. Just as the sight of Tommy didn't stop her from doing what she had to in order to save Lev, and now she's able to temper her rage as she might not have been able to previously. Ellie, Dina and Tommy killed all of Abby's friends, and she has the power over them now to end all of their lives. She chooses not to for Lev, ultimately, and in Lev the realisation that revenge never brought her peace, because what ultimately matters is having something to live for going forward. No amount of retribution is worth losing that when you've found it. When we reach the farm, with Ellie and Dina settled into a rural life with baby JJ to take care of, it's easy to think that the game is over, but the happy ending for the couple doesn't go beyond the surface, and when Ellie herds the sheep into the barn, a shovel falling over triggers the post-traumatic stress disorder that Joel's death has left her with. She's pushed into a nightmarish flashback, and returns to the world screaming as Dina tries to comfort her and the baby. Actor Tommy, half blinded by the bullet to his head and limping, tries to convince her to pursue Abby once more, he and Dina dismiss the notion. Tommy is angered by this and gets into a row with Dina. His anger is understandable, given all he's been through, but it's also a bitter poison eating away at him, no doubt the reason he and Maria are separated. And that poison seeps into Ellie, playing into all the trauma and conflicting impulses already at war in her mind, and on a restless night she picks up her guitar and plays us into a flashback to the night before Joel died. This is the party where she first kissed Dina and Seth responded with homophobia. Joel pushed Seth in response, only for Ellie to turn on Joel and insist she didn't need his help. The rift between them from when she learned the truth of his actions is still there, and as such she is torn between both the loss of her purpose in providing a cure, and the fact that Joel died without them reconciling. Ellie has too much left unresolved. Narratively, although going through the same broad arc as Abby, he's only up to the point that Abby was not Jackson. She's yet to have the realisation that vengeance doesn't equal peace, or to see her love for others and reasons to keep living in the now pull her back from the brink. This is because, ultimately, he still hasn't come to terms with surviving and going on living. As such, even with a seeming happy ending, he's pushed once more to pursue Abby, only now, Dina cannot make herself useful to the cause and enable it as before. She's fully aware of how destructive it is, and it pulls the two of them apart. This leaves Ellie with nothing except revenge. In Santa Barbara, we find a far more hopeful Abby searching for the Fireflies. Her relationship with Lev has at this point fully coalesced into a big sister little brother dynamic, and even with their loss it feels like they have family and something to keep them going forward. We see this in a note to Owen that Ellie finds too, showing how she is looking forwards rather than backwards now. Their search leads them to an abandoned barracks in a basement, but through the radio they learn that the Fireflies are regrouping on Catalina Island. However, they are captured by another faction we will soon meet, called the Rattlers. Ellie then follows Abby's trail from her boat up to Santa Barbara. When she's caught in a rattler trap, she manages to escape and discover where Abby is, or is badly wounded in the process. She stitches up the wound, but in the heat and the blood loss it is only her obsession driving her on. He recites the directions almost ritualistically whilst holding onto her side. The rattlers are slavers, and as brutal and well armed a group as we've yet encountered. Fighting through them, Ellie reaches where they keep the slaves, and frees them to fight back, only to find Abby is not there. She is at something called the Pillars on the beach. Ellie heads there, but very slowly now, as the battle has torn open her stitches. The Pillars turns out to be how the Rattlers punish those who try to escape, bringing them up in the heat to starve and die. Ellie is shocked by what she finds, and upon discovering Abby, still alive, somehow, she cuts her down. Abby watches Ellie warily, but when nothing happens, she moves to rescue Lev and carry him towards the water where there are boats. Ellie follows, slowly, and discards her own gear into a second boat. At this point, 
What happens next seems painfully inevitable. The blood on Ellie's hand conjures up an image of Joel's bloodied face, and she turns to announce that she can't let Abby leave. Abby's shoulders slump, but she carries on dealing with the boat, refusing to fight. Up until this point, feels like the battle to reach Abby and the sight of the pillars had worn Ellie out, not just physically, but emotionally. She had in earlier segments voiced the hope that Abby wasn't killed by anything other than her, which accounts for her cutting Abby down, but now it is as though she is being driven on by forces outside of herself. This of course feeds into her PTSD and the lack of resolution for everything that has occurred around Joel, before and after his death, being her key motivator. But now it is no longer a spirit possessing her so much as something else pushing her despite her crushing fatigue. Her threat towards Lev spares Abby into action, and this final fight of the game is as exhausting to play as it is for the characters. It serves well to impress upon us the sense that we, as Ellie, are going through the motions. That we shouldn't be doing this, but also that we can't not. That it is our actions, but not our choice or agency. Naughty Dog demands the player push on, as much as trauma demands Ellie push on. As Ellie kills Abby, just as when Ellie kills Nora, the victim fades from view and the camera focuses on Ellie. Once more, everything done to her in the earlier combat is now channeled through her, and her actions are the subject of the horror the game inflicts. But now Joel's face pops up, not bloody and dying, but sympathetic, looking at her warmly with his guitar in hand. Ellie pulls back, and Abby lives. <laughs> In the epilogue, where Ellie returns to the farm and finds it abandoned and empty but for Ellie's possessions, once more a guitar sequence returns us to a flashback. Only this time, because Ellie lost two fingers in her fight with Abby, the song is disjointed and incomplete, perhaps reflecting more accurately Ellie's connection to her memories of Joel. We see the memory that rose up before she spared Abby in full now. Ellie's last conversation with Joel, where she asserts her boundaries to him and also lays out her own feelings about what Joel did. You're such an asshole. I'm not trying to. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered. But you took that from me. Somehow, the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment. I would do it all over again. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. I like that. This doesn't represent a clean resolution to everything, and nor is it supposed to. Ellie and Joel reconciled, to a degree, but there was still so much left unsaid. That she is now focusing on this point in the conversation rather than the earlier rifts suggests that she is trying to heal, to come to terms with what happened and move forward. Pulling back from killing Abby would certainly represent a big step in doing that. But we also don't know how far along she is in that process. Dina and JJ represent something to live for, and we can read different things into the empty farmhouse versus Dina's bracelet on Ellie's wrist when it wasn't in Santa Barbara. As the story ends, both of our protagonists have moved significantly on from where they were at the start. Their arcs are parallel to one another, but not exact mirrors. Abby has healed and found family, with hope on the horizon of regaining a cause not as mired in blood as the WLF's was. Ellie has pulled herself back from the brink and appears to have begun to heal, though where she is in that process is left open to ambiguity. As for Joel, though he died near the start of the story, it's only at the end that we feel he may finally be laid to rest. The consequences of his actions have played themselves out and driven both women's journeys. And just as Ellie left behind those items which connected to him, so his lingering spirit can finally move on from the world. 
In a story where a hopeful status quo was shattered in favour of violence, despair and bleakness, at the last moment we can perhaps see the bloom of hope again. Whilst it is easy to see why the story of The Last of Us Part 2 is divisive, it's dishonest to say that this is because the story was bad. In construction and delivery, the craft was superb. The choices on where to take the narrative were hard ones, leading to dark places, and that's not for everyone, even amongst the subset of people who played and fell in love with the first game. But a story being difficult or not for you, or you disliking where it ended up, does not mean it wasn't done well. The pacing, too, was a deliberate choice, and in my view, the right one. This is a story about perspectives, and the game doesn't just want to show you Ellie and Abby's points of view in a detached way, but put you in their shoes. It cannot make you feel Ellie's anger and single-minded purpose if you sympathise with Abby, and though it cannot give you the same complete detachment from Ellie's perspective, we have, after all, followed her through two games, it can remove her from the picture for a while to allow you time with Abby and her friends to see their perspectives. Then, when the two come together, when they collide, you don't just know both stories, but have lived them. Not everyone felt empathy for Abby, of course. Whether that was a failure of the story or because the leaks and the hate on the game made them resolve to not like her is besides the point. If you don't feel the weight of their conflict, feel that whoever wins you will lose someone you care about, then it won't land the same for you as it did for me. For me though, the impact of the story as told through the dialogue, characterization, presentation and acting was utterly superb. This sits on top of a fun, challenging gameplay loop which makes for top-notch combat and stealth, stellar graphics which are even better with the PS5 patch, and accessibility which should set a new bar for all developers to aim for. There's an immense level of replay value too. Not only can you replay the game with all your weapons and upgrades in New Game Plus, but the various difficulty sliders give you a range of challenge options. The ground difficulty and the permadeath mode are particularly worth looking at if you're the kind of gamer who likes the challenge. You can even opt to play all of the combat encounters in the game in isolation, whether selecting a single one to play or playing through them in sequence. The game lets you skip exploration and crafting and just gives you a random loadout based on the difficulty for you to see how well you get on. Two years on, this game still holds my time and attention and will continue to do so. I want to see at least one more instalment of this franchise, and I want to see more games to play as this does. If we can do that without burying workers with unnecessary crunch, and we can discuss the merits and otherwise of games and media in general without being derailed by the culture war and the resulting death threats and harassment, then all the better. Thank you very much for watching. As I'm sure you can imagine, this video took an awful lot of time and effort to put together. As such, if you enjoyed it, then I'd be grateful if you gave it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content. Like the video that's just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. Check out the link in the description to my Patreon to support the channel directly and get perks like shoutouts and early access to videos. Again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.